Χριστό ανέστη νεκρών, θα ανατεθάνουν την πατήση και τη συντουμένη τη ζωή. Χαρισάμενο, αναστάσω ίσω από το τάφο, καθώ προείπει να δει και νυμίει την αιώνα ζωή και το μέγα έλεο. Good evening, everyone. So, this is the third synaxi about Nipsi. And um, uh, as we said, God willing, these uh, gatherings they will be every fortnight. And um, we we'll try to make them available to everyone as well by recording them. And we we'll see what happens in the future. Okay, do we have any questions for whatever we've been through so far? No? All right, so we will continue. As, as we said, when you have a question, don't wait for me to... I will be asking you as well if you have questions, but don't wait for me to finish um, a paragraph or something. Just um, interrupt me so we can understand things better instead of just keep going. So here the Similianos continues with um, analyzing the talk about vigilance and um, he says that the thought, the logismos, is very quick and can run away but if we want we can make him still with our willpower we can tie him up with our willpower and this, this can happen with our askisi and slowly slowly we get to the result that we want to get to we will just um, we will make a start and then God will be the one who will fulfill the whole thing. It's not us doing it. It's not our problem that our thoughts move so, so fast. This is a thought from the evil spirit that if our thoughts, they run too fast, we cannot control them. And the demon wants to present things as if they are very difficult and unachievable, but this is not the case. So we will do the vigilance, the nipsi, the watchfulness, as much as we can. But we also have to be careful what we talk about with others and what discussions we have in our own mind as well. So if, if someone comes along and um, starts telling us things that they are not appropriate, we need to be able to somehow either divert the conversation or just move on with what we have to do without falling into gossiping or idle talk or even just talking about others without a reason. Uh, of course, this doesn't mean that we will not be social, but we have to be careful when we talk to, with others. We can joke around, we can be happy, we can be pleasant, but we cannot talk about third persons that they're not present and especially saying bad things about people that they're not present because that's, that's gossiping and that's not, that's not right. That's, that's a sin. Another thing that Yerde Simiano says is that when, let's say that we're parents and we have a child and the mother and the father, they are very worried that something might happen to him or her, the child, and um, they're so worried that uh, they, if they find out that they did, he did something wrong, they will beat him up and um, talk to him in a bad way. Then the kid, even if he had done something wrong, he will not be happy with this behavior. He will go back and do worse things. But he has to understand, we have to understand that if we force him to be afraid to sin because he, there will be consequences from us, then he will go directly to do something bad. So violence can never, can never end up in something good. We need to tell our children what's right and what's wrong, but we need to also teach them what God is. And we need to talk to them from the fullness of our heart. And if our conscience is clean, and if there is joy in our hearts, then God will dwell in their hearts as well. He might be swearing, he might be sinning, but the, the sperms of God inside him, they will be so strong that new springs will come out, new plants, and the new plants, they will be bigger and they will give him life. It will be the plants of repentance and it will develop spiritually. So we need to let our children free because we respect them. So we tell them the truth, we tell them what our heart has, and then one day, even if they have fallen, they will understand that they have to go back to their parents' house, and um, this is how they will be resurrected. 
We know from the example of uh, Joel in the Old Testament, who lost everything, that regardless that he lost everything, through God, he ended up having greater blessings. And we know about Moses, the Ethiopian. He was a criminal, he was a murderer, he was a robber, but at the end of the day, he changed his life, he, and he became a new man, and um, he became a saint. So we can understand that even if someone has a problem, let's say, with anger, if he diverts all his anger and all this tension that's inside him towards God's love and peace, then if he diverts all his energy towards um, Jesus' prayer, Lord Jesus Christ have mercy upon me, a sinner, then um, he will succeed because God has given us all the things that we have. And, and this anger, it's a lot of strength that we have inside us, a lot of power. And if we direct it the right way, it will um, end up in good results spiritually. In our everyday life, Nipsis, vigilance, is like trying to keep our thoughts, we could say, we could use the word, try to freeze our thoughts. This means that we will not let our thoughts go here and there, but we will be in charge of them and uh, we will make them stand still. We think that it's impossible to keep our thoughts still, but after practice, it, does, it can happen. The same way someone stands up and stands still to see his enemy and defend himself, the same way we can make our thoughts stand in the door of our heart, when all the thoughts, the evil and the good ones, they come in and they go out from. Now, Yerida says something interesting. He says that our desires and our will, what we want to do, they do not attack us as desires or as ideas, but as thoughts. So everything starts from a thought. A thought comes and then the desire develops. So if we can take care of this first thought, then the desires, they will not develop. He also says that it's like when we don't want all these thoughts, eventually they will go away and the desires, they will faint, they will wither. But we might be responsible if we talk with the thoughts and we cultivate them because then they will keep coming back. Anything so far? How do you do that on a practical uh, level? How do you freeze the thoughts? How do you freeze a thought? You just recognize that it's there. And... No, you don't freeze the thought. You freeze where your position, you freeze where you're standing. So let's say that you find the point of concentration when you pray and you find something that helps you focus when you pray, you stay there. So this is like you're frozen there. And then this prayer, it could be Jesus' prayer, could be something else. You stay there and nothing can come in or out from your thoughts. So basically it's like everything stops. The circulation of the thoughts stops. So you cannot be attacked if you stand in the door and you don't let anyone in or out. It's all theoretical, but once you get a little bit of practice, then you understand what it is. Another way of uh, blocking the thoughts out is if you keep your mind occupied, let's use again the word frozen, with something which is precious for you spiritually. For example, God has given you to experience something. It could have been something simple like feeling a lot of love uh, for the church or for people that they are poor if you're doing charity work. Or it could be something like you had a spiritual experience and you remember this that you have experienced. If you, if you cultivate this thought by remembering it, this will keep your mind occupied and then nothing can come in and out again. But if you, if you have a spiritual experience and you think about it, it has another um, advantage as well because God is everywhere, right? Even if we understand Him or not. But if we have experienced Him and we recall this experience, it's like we reactivate the energy of this experience and we make him present again. It's like we force him to be present again. So let's say that once you go for Holy Communion, for example, and uh, you feel like you, you truly received Christ, you can't explain, you can't, it doesn't make any sense, but you felt this, right? right? 
if you were to think about this during your hard times and even all the time if you can this is like carrying Christ in your life during the day or during while you do your job while you you're cooking and this is how if you go to pray you can help your prayer start by remembering something precious that you have experienced and um, your prayer can start from there and then it moves on so the thoughts is, is there anything else before we move on okay the thoughts they are like uh, robbers and uh, we need to be careful and um, be vigilant and see what they are trying to do or say to us. Once we're standing in the, in the gate of our heart, uh, as we said before, then we can see them trying to get in and out. And that's where we should have our focus, where the thoughts that go in and out. By, by using the prayer, it's like we block their way of going in and out. So if we're not careful of these criminals, the thoughts, they can kill us and they can steal away the treasure of Nipsey that we have. That's why we shouldn't just have a look what they're trying to do. We should also understand if they're trying to get in or out. And when, when we get uh, attacked sometimes, we can more or less understand that this thought has a specific intention. And uh, you can tell, for example, someone comes to you, you're in a monastery. He talks about examples from the monastery because this synaxi was amongst monastics, that's why. Otherwise, the example could have been anything. Uh, so you're, you're sitting in your monastery and uh, the thought comes and tells you, why don't you go to the desert to be by yourself, to be able to communicate with God better, and uh, to be a great ascetic like um, Saint Joseph the Hesychast and this and that. And uh, the thought also tells you no one loves you here. So just uh, go to the desert and you will be more spiritual. But this is, this is an evil thought and you can understand where it will end up. It will end up throwing you out of the monastery. It's the same within a family. You're married and um, you have a husband, you have a wife, and the thought might tell you, how about if I go out with some friends without the wife, and then these friends, they might bring some other friends of the opposite sex, and then, and then the one thing brings the other, and then phone calls, and then this and then that, and, and basically this thought can throw you out of your family. It's the same thing. So that's why that's why we need to be careful of these thoughts and understand where they are leading up to. The ascetics, they talk about protonia. Protonia from protos and nous. So this means the first thought. So once we wake up, they tell us we have to give our protonia, our first thought to God. And this is very important because once we wake up in the morning, if our thoughts don't go directly to God and they go to our mobile or they go to emails or worries and other things, then even if we try to pray after before going to work or before having our breakfast, it won't be as easy. But if our thought goes directly to God without distraction, this protonia, this first thought, if it's dedicated to God, then it's easier for us to pray. And from this if we don't be careful with this protonia, with the first thought and something else enter, one thought brings the other, the next one, the next one, you will see that you will start from an apple and you will end up in a swimming pool. You end up somewhere totally different, totally far away and, and, um, and irrelevant to God. And then if you want to pray, you just wasted all this effort and then you have to try and get your mind back and it's not always as easy as if you just... Um, Try to dedicate your first thought to God. So all our struggle, in reality, it's a struggle against the thoughts. That's why the ascetics, they call everything logismo. So I have one logismo, I have one thought. This means that this word logismos, the thoughts, they have so much power that from them, anything can happen to us. Behind the thoughts, there is hidden either the tempter or our passions, depending where the thought comes from. Depends if it comes from our intellect, or from our willpower, or from our thimiko, which is the strength that we have inside us to do things.
And then when we want to reject the responsibility, like when we don't want to accept our responsibility about the thought, we will say that the tempter gave me this thought. But sometimes it's not the tempter that gives us the thought, but it's ourselves that we want to think about something, so we accept the thought and we cultivate it. The thoughts, in a way, they are like the legs of our intellect, and they can go, they can lead our intellect wherever they want. So we need to understand that our intellect is one thing and the thoughts is another. And once we are in control of our thoughts, our intellect will follow because the body follows the legs. The thoughts, they might be strong and they might be able to run fast, but this should not um, make us despair because we can be in charge of our legs and we can tell them where to go. And if we tell them to go and follow the cliff, they will. But if we know that we will kill ourselves, we, we simply won't do it. So, for example, I'm a carpenter and I'm creating a table. And um, the tempter comes and gives me the idea to make it um, nicer by engraving something which is like a face on the surface of the table. Another example. Someone goes and sees your spiritual father, you have a common spiritual father, he goes and see and talks to your spiritual father and then he comes and tells you to go and see him as well. And then the thought tells you, what did this person say to Yerida against me? It's like we think that someone accused us of something to Yerida. This is a thought and this is from the tempter and uh, we have to be aware of these things. So on the first occasion with the table, we will just waste our time if we do extra things that are not necessary, like the engraving that it was not supposed to happen if it was not supposed to happen. With the second example, the thought will make us to turn against our fellow men who just told us to go and see Yeruda, and then we will have thoughts about Yeruda as well, if we believe that um, something happened behind our back. So without, without understanding it, with the help of the demon, we fall into the trap of the demonic energy, which is this thought that we end up accepting and cultivating. Anything so far? You can just wait in the morning and we have another little sleep. And you have a hard sleep before you wake up. I can be very nice to um, You try your best once you are conscious to think about God. But when we're tired, it's more difficult. It is what it is. Like, we, we can only try. It's not always achievable. That's why the fathers of the church, they talk about two ways of praying. The one is that you can sit down to pray and your prayer might be going very easily. And the other way is that you will struggle to get your prayer to where it should go. But they're both equal prayer. So the one, the one way is that I sit down to do Kubushini and I find it very easy and my prayer runs. That's one way of doing it. The other way is that I sit down and I find it extremely difficult but I push myself and I don't give up. And then eventually it will get to the point where it should be. Yeah, so it doesn't matter what happens. What matters is for us to keep doing what we have to do. So if in the previous example there was a period of time between knowing that we have to see our spiritual father and thinking about what he could have told to the other person or the other person could have told him and develop all these scenarios inside our mind, then when we will go to see our spiritual father, things will be worse because we have already developed um, all these thoughts inside our mind. And this is how we get tricked from the devil. The devil, as soon as he sees that we give up Nipsey, he will give us some thoughts and then he will also give us fantasies. And um, this imagination, this fantasy that we might develop is what will lead us where we should not be in our thoughts and actions. So the devil plays with us with fantasies. Once we start talking with our thoughts, then the fantasy is like he puts colors in the pictures and makes it more attractive. Then it's like if we accept this fantasy and keep following them, it's like we 
we allow the tempter to work deeper inside us with um, the thoughts that he started before. Then he doesn't need to stick around because he did his job with, um, with the pictures, with the fantasy that he developed. He can go away and tempt other people, but the fantasy itself will continue developing and continue to talk to our thoughts and motivate our thoughts to cheat against our intellect. And then eventually, we will end up doing something we were not supposed to do if we follow these fantasies, which is the pictures inside us drawn by the devil. Anything? How does the tempter know our thoughts? The tempter doesn't know our thoughts. And this is very important to know. Only the Holy Spirit knows our thoughts. And that's why if you go to a medium, because usually they've got the evil spirit, they're not holy people. But if you want to check that, you can, you can trick them by saying a prayer, then having a specific thought which is yours and tell them to reveal you this thought. They won't be able to do it. They can't do it. But what they do is that the demons, they give you thoughts, they reveal the thoughts to them, and then you think, oh, they know what they're talking about. Or they can, they can tell them about your past. The devil knows your past because he has thousands of years of um, being on earth. So he knows, and he moves so quickly from one place to the other. So they can tell you about your past, they can predict the future without being so, but by seeing what you were doing, what you're doing, they can tell you what, what you might do, and they might tell you that this is what you will do. But this is all tricks, it's not, it's not true knowledge. So they the demons don't know if you're trying to practice music. They can see it from outside you, like depends if you like if you try and stay focused or if you if you make it obvious, they can see it. But if it's something which is natural to you and you don't indicate anything, they will understand it. They might also understand it if they give you thoughts and you just don't cultivate them, they will see that you don't cultivate the thoughts. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if they understand or not. We have to do what we have to do. It's better if we don't make it obvious, not for the demons, because even other people, they might think, what is this person doing? It? But we have to do what we can do to keep our mind as focused as possible. When we say focus, we don't mean that we squeeze our mind to stay there. We try little by little, and then it becomes more and more, and then it becomes more natural, and then we do something, we achieve something. Anything else? Can we ask the this practice sits in context with psychology. In other words, if we go and speak with a therapist or a psychologist, they might ask us to tell them all about thoughts. Whereas if we're trying to practice vigilance, we may not be trying to give attention to specific thoughts. Yes. Now, by saying your thoughts, you reveal to the psychologist what you suffer from. By rejecting your thoughts, is you trying to develop yourself spiritually. There are two different things. So, even if you go to your spiritual father, if there is a thought that keeps coming back, you have to confess it. Why? Because it shows that there is something inside you generating this. And this will give an indication of what your heart desires or what your heart suffers from. It's the same with the psychologist, but the psychologist they just want every thought which shows what's inside us but at the same time, it might show what we are tempted with. But usually we are tempted with things that they can find, how can I put it, the devil knows what we're weak with, and he will give us uh, thoughts associated to this weakness. So it makes sense to talk about our thoughts in this sort of way, because we will reveal to the psychologist what we suffer from, but then to cure ourselves, once we acknowledge, if we can acknowledge what we suffer from, is to ignore everything and just focus to God and that's it. And I think some of the modern psychologists, they sort of touch the techniques that the Desert Fathers were using. It's interesting. They come from a totally different approach, but they, they talk for similar things. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them. Now, if we want to progress in our spiritual life, we have to close every door behind us so we close every door behind us and we do what we have to do we focus on christ we move on 
When um, Gerdes Emilianos was in Meteora, that's when he started um, the brotherhood and the sisterhood in Meteora, sometimes he would go to Kalabaka, which was the nearest Horyo, whatever it was, Poli, and he would preach there, he would have confessions, then he would end up going back to the monastery during the evening. All day he was doing pastoral work. He used to say that once he entered the gate of the monastery, and once he sat the gate of the monastery, he would leave all the day that he passed behind, and he would get in free. This is what we need to do. This is what the husbands and wives have to do at their home. After work, and this is for everyone, monks or married people, after work, all the trouble that we had, all the difficulties, all the discussions, everything, 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 once we enter the door of the house and we close it behind us, left out, and from then onwards, it's just the family. Or if there is a monk or a nun, it's just Christ. Or if you're doing your job, it's just your job. I mean, if you have to do something at home. Um, if you do this, you don't transfer the temptations and the difficulties to your environment, and you can live a normal life. You free your soul from the burdens of the day, and then you recharge, and the next day you can handle the reality again. Otherwise, this is where anxiety starts, when you carry them with you, and uh, then problems, and then whinging within the family and then getting upset easily and all this sort of stuff that they don't help. So without Nipsey in the family, things are not the same. It's very important, very important. Anything else? And to stop that from becoming fantasies. To stop your logismus to, to become fantasies, you have to start from when they are little, so when they first attack. If you don't start then, then they will develop. And if they develop, they will become fantasies, and then it's more difficult. Once you see that there is a thought coming, you either use Jesus' prayer, or if, we said this before, if there is a thought that it's very, very strong, just distract yourself with focusing on something irrelevant. And then if you focus on something irrelevant for a short period of time, it doesn't have to be spiritual, something that will distract you from this thought. The thought after that will be 50%, will have 50% less strength and then you can manage it with prayer. But sometimes even prayer is not helping us manage some thoughts that they are very, very strong. Mm. But as we said before, if God has given us to experience some things with Him, some, some of His grace, if we recall this experience, this can save us from all the attacks of the thoughts. It's like, this is like a safe cave where we run in to avoid a storm. And when the storm passes, we can move on. Mm. Anything else? We need to be honest with ourselves sometimes because we might be thinking that we're trying against thoughts towards spirituality, but if our heart still wants to do things that we are thinking that we're trying to avoid, it's not the devil's fault and it's not that we don't practice Nipsey, it's just that we haven't prepared ourselves to get rid of specific things. We haven't prepared ourselves to sacrifice something from what we like. And then the thoughts, it's way easier to become imagination because it's something that we want. Could be an ice cream, could be anything, but it's, it's something that the tempter knows that inside us has strong roots. So we need to be honest with ourselves and not blame the devil for everything and not blame the thoughts for everything and not blame the lack of Nipsey for everything. We have to understand that there are some fields in our life that we need to try harder. We need to work hard on ourselves in these fields. Like, I need to work on not gossiping, for example. If I hear someone talking about something, I will get involved, I will say, 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 say. That's a weakness for someone, and um, it's common. So if we see that we have this passion, we need to work extra. Once we see a little bit of a movement inside us, to 
stop it straight away otherwise this can very quickly grow and become imagination and tell us what to say and talk with our thoughts and all sort of stuff after that it's not easy but it's not difficult and if we were to consider how important it is it's not difficult and as we said the last time even not practicing nipsi and staying with your thoughts it's not easy because then they suffocate you and you don't know where to go right left middle you get confused so this is also very difficult to be confused so at least we try the proper way and we don't get confused and if we are looking for an answer in something if we practice nipsi we don't need to try and think what god wants but the answer will be more clear it will come by itself and then what well, we said back some god yes what in a prayer set so not in every day but in a so you sit you sit down and try for some what aspect of god are you focusing on in your prayer or in your daily life in your prayer it depends what sort of prayer you practice if you practice Jesus prayer you focus on Jesus prayer the Lord if you chant you focus on chant some people they can chant and they can say Jesus prayer while the other chant is chanting and but you can you can sort of pray this way as well but what do you mean is this the is this what you're asking yeah so when you said Jesus prayer you don't think about something else no god no no, no. You, you don't you don't you don't think about anything else because if you start thinking about something else it's like developing meditation this is what meditation is they they imagine things and then these fantasies get influence from the devil and then they start having visions and stuff and it's not that pretty it's actually scary a lot of psychologists they suggest meditation we have to be careful that breathing exercises is one thing meditation is not so if they suggest that we do some breathing exercises is good but for us who are orthodox christians we can get the jesus prayer within this breathing routine and make sure that we make it like a prayer instead of uh, following a meditation sort of way. What about when we're sitting in silence? Sometimes our fathers tell us sit, stand in front of the icon of Banahia and, and remain silent. And we try and focus on having a clear mind and being still and, and we can say the Jesus prayer. But how do we remain vigilant, vigilant when we're focusing so much on the silence? Does this make sense? When you say Jesus prayer, you focus on the Jesus prayer, you don't focus on the silence. What do you mean by silence? You know how when you were mentioning meditation yeah. earlier? To slow our bodies down, to slow our thoughts down, remaining silent. That's what I mean when I when I mean silence. Okay. Yeah. Once I heard this somewhere, I hope I can remember it. So once they asked a spiritual father, can I smoke while praying and the spiritual father said definitely not and someone told him now you asked the wrong question you should have asked can i pray while smoking and the answer would have been yes so here we're talking about silence and prayer it depends where you're focusing if you focus on the silence or if you focus on the prayer now when they give you a technique a breathing technique the focus might be on silence and the prayer might be the background but for us Christians, when we pray, the focus is the prayer, it's not the silence. So we, we focus on the prayer, and then we will go through stages. And these stages might be feeling silence, it might be feeling like we cry out to God, it might feel like we fight with God to, to achieve what our prayer is asking for. If you, if you were to ever read the talk of Pierre de Miliano on prayer, which is on a small book called uh, The Church of Prayer. It indicates all these stages of prayer, but the focus is prayer. And these, the stages that we go through, every soul, uh, could last months, could last years, it could, anyway, it's different for everyone. But the focus is not on what we experience, the focus is on prayer. And as we move along with prayer, things are changing for us. Now, if, 
if your goal is to focus on silence, I don't know if that's for a specific reason or if that's from a psychological point of view, but for us Orthodox, the focus is on prayer, it's not on silence. Of course you have to reject all the thoughts and get your mind silent to be able to pray, but the focus is prayer. It doesn't matter if if you're in a thunderstorm, the focus is prayer, it's not the silence. Yolanda, I have a question about some of these New Age faiths and how they tend to look to figureheads, you know, for worship and for intercession. And a lot of the time these figureheads are actually disguised as angels, archangels, entities of the Orthodox Church. For the people who are practising these faiths, the people that find, you know, these communications with these entities very real, what is going to help them to discern whether or not the communications they're experiencing are from God or not? From its taste. What does this mean? If you have experienced God, and if you have experienced the evil spirit, you can sense what they are giving you, with which source is coming from. So you can sense if it has a sweetness, something humble, something loving, it's from God. If it brings anxiety, if it's forcing you to tell something to someone, to do something, because this is what God wants, that's not from God. So from the taste, you can tell if a thought or if an experience is from God or not. But for those who do not have both tastes and they cannot compare, they need a spiritual father who has both tastes and knows. And once you tell him, he will tell you this is from God or this is not from God. He will tell you in both occasions, just ignore it and move on. Because if you yourself are looking for miracles, you will definitely be doomed. You can't be going around looking for miracles because the easiest way is for the devil to give you a miracle and then if you want to see your angels or whatever, that can happen, but it's not going to be from God. How do these people know? They need to have a spiritual father and confess these things. And if they don't, then they don't know, right? If they don't, if they didn't have a previous experience, they will not know. But if it's a humble person, will understand that even if it is from God, all right, we're not going to write a sign on our forehead, a hard and spiritual experience, we move on. And if it was from God, it was from God. If it wasn't, it wasn't. Who cares? We move on. Because God will, will reward us if, for example, we are in charge of someone's house while he's away and the owner comes and knocks on the door. And because we think that it's not the owner, we don't open the door, the owner will be happy because we try to keep his house safe. But if we open the door and it's not the owner, and the house gets um, vandalized, the owner will not be happy. So it's always safe to keep the door shut, regardless if it's from God or not. And if it's from God, it will come again, it will come in a different form. It will inform our heart with love and humility and joy and happiness. These things are qualities that the devil doesn't possess. The, the, the grace, it's not grace, the, the experiences that the devil gives, they are rough, they have something which is not peaceful, it's not it doesn't give you ease, it gives you anxiety, it makes you, makes you proud, makes you want uh, people to know about you. So it's not a humble thing. But you can tell. Usually they're very, very, it's very clear. And also when, when you hear people telling you that their angel came and told me to go and tell this person this and that, in my opinion, they're all rubbish. Their angel will not worry if you tell this person go and buy this. There are more serious things for their country to worry about. It's just that we want to show that um, it's either psychological or it's uh, spiritual in the negative way, it's from the tempter. So we either want to show off or the tempter gives us something which fills up our ego and we fall in, and that's what it is. Everyone who wants to practice a spiritual life needs a spiritual father. That's very simple. And needs a spiritual father that knows about this if you're going to practice prayer and nipsi, because if you have a spiritual father that doesn't know about it, then you won't get the right answers, regardless how much he might want to help you.
it's like you, you need a specialist. You don't need a GP, you need a specialist here. So you go to the, you go to the right specialist, you go, don't go to something which is totally different. But they're not safe in these things. You need to have someone to talk to him about all these things. You can't, we can't deal with these things ourselves without having the knowledge. It's very dangerous. People even lost their minds with these things. Last question. It's here. Does that translate as stillness in the heart? Or is it music? Stillness in the heart. But to get stillness of the heart, do you need music? We do. We do. Yes. Does music clean your conscience to then allow you to understand that your conscience is, if it's the voice of God, you will sing? Yes, it does. But also, Remember what we mentioned before, we ourselves have to close all the doors behind us. So something happened, all right. If we, are, if we might forget it, we keep a note for confessing it, but we don't dwell in it, we move on, we move on. Otherwise, let's say you said something, someone told you something and you talked back in a nasty way, you didn't mean to, but you did. You can keep thinking the same thing for a week if you think that you heard this person and if your conscience is sensitive. No, we make a note, we will probably won't forget it to confess, but if we think we might, we make a note. We know we want to confess it, it's as if we did, in the sense that we don't go back thinking about it all the time. Because then the scenario starts, if, if they said this and I said that, if I could have avoided this and this, and it's endless, it can drive you crazy. You lose your peace. Do we shut the door on everything, including the, the happy moments and the, I guess, the good memories? If the good memories are helping you, you keep them. But if you want to focus on Christ, you only keep the spiritual ones, if it has to do with prayer. If it has to do with your everyday life, you might need to keep the, the good memories because they will keep you motivated to keep going. And it's good to have positivity in our lives. And some of us, we need positivity more than others. Did, does every year have do nipses? And every year also do nipses? Um, there are two different, believe it or not, there are two different schools of monasticism. There are ones that they focus on services and their diaponimata, their jobs mostly, and they do some prayer. And uh, the other school that they do all this, but they do focus on prayer a lot and they focus on lipsy a lot. Mm -hmm. They're called theoretiki ke praktiki, malu praktiki ke theoretiki. So the practical ones that they do their, their services and um, their jobs during the day for the monastery and then there are the theoretical, the theoretical ones in the sense of they try to achieve the theory of God, the experience of God. Uh, so no, not every, not every elder will have the same spirit, not every monastery will have the same spirit regarding prayer and in the same monastery you will find if it is a monastery like uh, Simonopetra, where the spirit is more free in a way of we won't make, force everyone to do the same things, but whatever suits to everyone. You will find people that they pray more than others, and you will find people that they focus on the theoretical uh, life of praying more. And uh, the interesting thing is that um, it's sort of proven that it's like Martha and Maria in the Gospel. The one was serving and the other one was sitting on Jesus' feet. So the ones that they like Martha, and they try to serve and serve, they will complain that Maria was just sitting on Jesus' feet. But which was the greatest? Of course, Martha gave food to Christ and ate, but Maria wanted to absorb Jesus' love. And that's what stays at the end of the day, even if she had nothing to give him in return. So there are two different schools, even, even, even within one monastery, two different approaches. And it would be the same with the married people. You could have these two different approaches in if someone has a married life. Someone might just focus on taking care of the job, the family, and that's it. But some other people, they might think, no, that's not enough. 
we have to do everything for Christ. The family has to be um, Christ oriented. Everything has to be around Christ, around prayer. And that's how we have families with maybe five kids. And you can see all the kids praying, having a personal and spiritual um, rule every night. You see all the boys and girls, little ones, sitting with the kuboskini, doing two kuboskini before going to bed. This is great because when they will have their own families, they will teach the same. And this is how spirituality is passed through the generations and how kids learn about Mips. Because when they pray, they will tell you, oh, I can't focus. And you tell them, try not to think about things, try to think of the words of prayer. And this is how it starts. And it's good to know these things from little. It does help. It does help. I guess that's it. All right. We say the final prayer. Χριστός ανέστηκε πρώτον θανάτου θάνατο πατήσκε και της μόνος ο Ιχαρισάμενος, αληθώς ανέστη ο Κύριος.